Hey everybody, Brian Von Vier here. Today we're going to be talking about magic and how do people in your world learn magic. Are they given it by a deity or similar entity? Do they learn it by getting into student debt and studying for 20 years after which they can drop fireballs? Or are they born with it or something else? Now on average, you don't. It happens randomly when you mix with the world outside the universe. For example, a tear between universes opens near you as you are conceived or you enter a tear near death. You can't see these tears, by the way. This means you get to have shadow powers or teleportation at the lowest level. It boosts your skills like smarts or athletics or something. Another way to learn magic is to do apocryphal acts which will most likely lead to the opposite of what you expect. Also, magic will always take. So the more you use, the more of your soul that takes, to the point where you just wither away slowly. Stumble upon an old forgotten god reigniting its engines through reading its tomes and making small, insignificant sacrifices to its totem idol, because the whispers said to. All to slowly but surely embellish it with followers as it blesses its tithes with good harvests and business all for it to eventually corrupt and bring about its resurrection and be defeated with the gifts it gave and for the beauty of magic that blessed the plain to go silent once again. Till the next eventual discovery of its tomes in Totem Idol. In Perpetuity. I love variation, so in the three settings of mine where magic is a thing, it's a very different thing. In the Middle Lands, the whole world is under the influence of extremely powerful magical energy flows called winds. Fire, ice, life, and death, each blowing from one of the cardinal directions and of the light, emanating from a central tower of light which greatly tames the winds and makes life possible around it. Wind masters and the local mages exploit these forces with complex, optic-like instrumentation. But the art is excessively dangerous considering the powers they work with and it takes a lifetime of dedication to become a wind master. In the Sleepy Valley, magic is much easier. Actually, only the spirits are able to do true magic and they create spells and sell them to the other enchanted races. This rather funny setting plays, as far as magic is concerned, with the notion of spell and the underlying source code. If your water boiling spell doesn't work anymore, it might be because you need to buy an update. Lastly, in a yet unnamed setting, magic is mostly divination. Only a handful of children are born each year with a sensitivity for magic which will start to become apparent in their early teens. The rootless power in place on the planet, engaged in century-long wars with powerful neighbor worlds, does everything possible to detect those children both to forcefully train them to serve and to avoid them later becoming a threat. In this world, magic is a curse. For the children, it means slavery and training in a nightmarish version of Hogwarts or death. And for the families, it means losing their child for good. In my setting, learning how to perform magic isn't particularly difficult. With training, one can learn to see the interactions magic makes with things in the world and the user trained to move their vitality basically an inner energy sort of thing into their hands to manipulate magic and do some of the common verbal, somatic, and mental components spell requires. Often takes a few years of training, though some pick it up much quicker than others. Now the big issue is actually finding the spells. The general idea for spells is the user noticing an interaction between magic and mundane things, figuring out what is the product of such a thing then mimicking it through various means and amplifying it to produce a stronger effect. The huge issue is that noticing these interactions are heavily up to interpretation of the user and studying such things is often described as, well, watching paint dry. What happens most often is that the user notices interactions between things that they'd already have knowledge or experience with, which affects the spells they acquire. For example, 
A storyteller might tell a tale to the crowd, notice the same magical interaction occur every time, and may figure out how to reproduce the effect mentally and amplify it, resulting in them learning a spell that allows them to calm emotions. A fisherman that's constantly looking at a lake may see how the magic actually interacts with the waves and how they shift and change before a storm hits, figuring out how to make a spell that manipulates water or wind in some form. Depending on how someone learns spells results them in getting a different classification. Bards are those who notice the interactions between people and magic. Druids and bards, I assume they mean ranger here, see how it connects with nature or other living things. One type of cleric can actually see how the divine interacts with the mortal, whereas warlocks and how strange beings interact with magic, etc. So, how do spell scrolls and items that allow you to cast spells such as the Wand of Fireballs actually affect this? That is almost considered separate, and is called Runic. Runic is often created through carvings with which magic is drawn to and flows through the use of certain materials, and the way it weaves and shifts will produce an effect mimicking the somatic and material components of a spell. Some may even mimic verbal. The main qualm is that most of a spell is generally done mentally, so to make it done without it results in it needing to be particularly complicated, and it can be likened to programming using code except you need to carve it in things. Well, interestingly though, magical talent isn't required whatsoever in this case. There are several different origins to runic, resulting in different kinds of code, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. Unlike spells, because they lack a mental aspect, information on it can be passed down or more easily recorded for future use. A lot of effects were created through the study of how biological creatures produce certain effects. As an example, a wolf might have a particular fur pattern that allows it to better blend into the background, and an artificer who studies runic might take that as an inspiration. The other part is narrowing down the effect, so while the wolf's fur pattern might appear to have one use, it actually might produce many different uses, and someone attempting to create runic will need to focus it down to the one effect. For your Wand of Fireballs example, an artificer would attempt to understand how the fireball spell is done, or study a creature that produces a comparable effect, then convert it into some kind of code. The magic being done is pretty straightforward, so they would use Gigant, the Code of Giants. Most of the runes would be placed near the end of the wand where the fire would be produced and sent off. They would also need to consider a material that won't result in the runes being warped by the heat. Finally, once they have everything down, they will send it off to a very skilled blacksmith to be created. How difficult the magical item is depends on a variety of factors. A flame tongue sword that is on fire is very easy to program, since it is mainly just producing flames, but the blade itself requires special materials and crafting that allows it to handle the heat, abuse it might receive in battles, and make it easy to fix. Meanwhile, a wand of fireballs is more complicated to program, since it needs to gather fire into a shape allow for aiming, and shoot it off, meanwhile the materials and creation is pretty simple. For my griffinkin, it's tied to the fact their magical abilities are overwhelmingly tied to the magical elements and materials that lace their bodies, tissues, and especially their beaks, wing feathers, talons, and the claws and pads of their hind paws. They are born with an instinctual understanding that making this particular movement of a talon along with that twitch of the various tissues and glands that absorb, process, and store the ambient mana from the ground and air cause that result, and vice versa. From there though, they learn from their dancer shamans. In this universe, the shamans dance the more powerful spells. A quick burst of mana from the beak or a quick talon gesture has results but the more powerful ones require extensive writing on the air or ground to pull off, whilst the quick dance of a pad on ground, talon gestures, and flaps and twists and positions of the wings are both more powerful and normally quicker due to having an extra pair of hands with their wings to weave the spell. About the proper postures, stances, 
wing positions, placement of each padded toe, and talon positions to ensure proper results, along with consulting the runic language they use to write their spells and as their written language. Further study can take place if a particular griffin wishes it at any of the biped schools and academics for methods of magic that will work off vocal incantations, which can actually be difficult due to the shape and hard palate of their beak and mouth to reproduce easily. But as griffins have syrinx instead of larynx in their throat, they can usually get close enough the spell works, even if it's low powered compared to a human mage chanting the same spell. As soon as they gain the ability to weave, either by near death or at their own hands or at another high altitude, they have a time limit to learn if they wish. Weavers tend to die very young, living from 5 to 25 years after gaining their abilities, with one notable exception. Learning weaving is hard in due part due to the short lifespan. Schools exist in states funded by governments, however these mainly delve into economic or military applications. Teachers also exist, but only operate in professional settings. They retire young. Trial and error is common, and many die due to accidentally tearing their limbs, self-induced seizures, or gangs. Some take to weaving enhancing drugs to speed up the process, however, this comes with further health issues and addiction to the max. Think breathing pure drugs at the end of your life. Yeah, don't do drugs, kids. We all watched the D.A.R.E. program. They can't. They have to ask for it, and they must do it by going down into the depths of hell. They must make a request of a devil, and to receive that request, they must do anything for this evil spirit. The gods created these people as they wanted something very beautiful and intelligent. They wanted them to gain their intelligence on their own and not some form of mystical power. Look, if you need me to talk to a succubus for you, here's my name, here's my address, and let's have some fun. In the world of Taros, the world I've been building up, magic comes in the forms of different powders known as Afa or Dust. Anyone can use it in its basic form, but honing your skills is required for more effective and more powerful spells. The Afa is traded by merchants and researched by scholars. In order to use it, you need a reactant, the Afa. A conductor, succus, a dried sap from a world tree known as Ares, and an amplifier, usually a bracelet or a bangle. I have done mock-ups and research papers on my profile if you're interested in checking it out. Yo, if you're listening in, can we have a link to that? We want to know a little bit more because that's actually quite intricate and cool. Hey everybody, Brian Von VA check in after the video. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, ring that bell, and of course let us know how do people in your world learn magic? If you'd like a really interesting low magic, low fantasy type, uh, low fantasy novel, check out The Dwarves. Yes, I've said it for years and I continue to say it. It is the best mix of politics, magic, fantasy, combat, romance, horror, name it. It's in there and trust me, even their magic system is something to revel at. Love you all. Be safe, be happy. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.